I want to welcome all of you to this, our, uh, our first research spotlight uh, seminar of the new academic year. My, uh, my name is Marcus Busman. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering here at the U of T. And at the moment, I'm the chair of our department of mechanical and industrial engineering as well. I, um, I really uh, appreciate that you've joined us online for what I think will be a, a terrific presentation. Um, but before I introduce Professor Don Mez, I just want to say a few words about um, you know, what's going on here at the U of T at the moment. It's obviously been a, a really unusual year. Um, you know, here in Ontario, we, uh, we shut things down here at the U of T in mid-March. Um, so last academic year. And so for the past, or for the last uh, six weeks or so of the winter term, um, our professors had to, over a weekend, basically move their courses from in-person to, to online. Uh, we survived that winter term. It was um, it was stressful, but I think uh, overall we did what we could, and uh, and it turned out all right. Uh, then over the summer, the decision was made by the U of T to uh, to put uh, basically all education um, all education online for the fall. And at the moment, uh, the Faculty of Engineering has even made the decision that almost everything will be online even in the winter term. So we're already looking ahead uh, six and eight months. Um, and so over the summertime, this past summer, a lot of our professors and instructors spent a lot of time learning how to teach online and moving courses online. And uh, based on some feedback that uh, Shannon and I and others got just recently for, from some uh, upper year mechanical and industrial students, we've, um, we've done pretty well. The students thought that uh, we were off to a good start. And so I hope we're able to continue to do that. And then on the research front, um, certainly our researchers were, were completely, um, off campus for a couple of months. They started coming back on in late June. And uh, so for those researchers, grad students, postdocs, professors who, um, who need access to their lab equipment on campus, um, they've been able to get back to campus since about midsummer under very controlled conditions. So we just have to make sure that we're, um, we're uh, doing everything we need to to make sure that we don't have um, pandemic outbreaks here on campus. And I think we've been pretty successful at that. So that's, um, that's what's going on here. It's obviously been a hugely unusual year. Um, let me turn now to introducing a, a wonderful colleague and, a, and what I think will be a, a wonderful seminar. Professor uh, Bearson Don Mez is a, a colleague in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering with an interesting background, studied mechanical engineering uh, as an undergrad and then went on to study statistics and industrial engineering and human factors in particular for a PhD. She joined our department in 2010 and in the past 10 years has built quite a reputation for herself um, on her research related to, um, to human factors, which she'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, so what Bearson does is study human behavior and performance in complex situations. And I think you'll see that as regards her, uh, her research on, on, on driving and vehicles. Um, She's become very well known kind of worldwide for this research um, as evidenced by um, participation in a number of big committees and conferences that uh, relate to her research. Uh, she is a, um, an NSERC Canada Research Chair here at the university uh, in the area of human factors and transportation. Um, and for example, serves on multiple committees of the US-based Transportation Research Board for the National uh, Academies in the US and is chair of one of those committees at the moment. So Beerson, interestingly enough, joins us um, today from where she grew up in Istanbul, Turkey. That's where she is uh, sitting out the pandemic. And with this, um, I will turn it over to Beerson. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I will say that if you have questions, and I hope you do during the presentation, um, click on the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen and enter those questions there. And when Beerson is done, she's gonna leave us a few minutes uh, at the end of her presentation will then take up some of those questions and allow her to answer them. So without further ado, I, um, I welcome Bearson Donmez to this seminar. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marcus, for the lovely introduction. Um, so uh, I, I am in Istanbul, uh, but it looks like I may not be here for too long, so I might have to change countries, uh, kind of spreading across multiple countries family-wise. It has been a bit of a challenge uh, during this pandemic time. Share my screen. So thank you very much for uh, 
for taking the time to attend this talk. I know that uh, there was some excitement uh, in the beginning when we first uh, switched to virtual. And it appears that based on my, uh, my interactions with people who do, um, who do arrange virtual events that the appetite for virtual events is now going down. I think people are maybe getting a little bit tired of the virtual interaction. So I do appreciate you, uh, you attending this talk. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about uh, smarter cars and safer driving and how human factors relates to the design of these technologies uh, that make our cars smarter. Um, it's going to be a high level talk. Um, it's going to be research light, so I'm not going to be uh, talking about the details about our research design or, or results, but I just want to give you a general idea of the state of the art um, in terms of um, kind of advanced vehicle technologies and, uh, and where we are going and uh, what kind of human factors considerations um, are, um, are needed to be taken into account. Um, my laboratory is called the Human Factors and Applied Statistics Laboratory. Uh, we look at operator and technology interaction um, and also try to, to evaluate uh, operator performance uh, as they interact with technologies. Um, in particular, we are interested in multitasking activities um, and that actually lends itself very well to the driving domain as uh, as you may know right drivers do multitask um, and we do try to basically support the drivers um, to be safer and more productive within the vehicles um, the main application area is surface transportation but we also do research in the healthcare domain in particular related to interruptions experienced by healthcare operators um, such as nurses um, who work in ICUs, as well as operating room teams. We do try to understand um, kind of the distractions and the interruptions that happen within those environments and try to come up with strategies to, to either reduce, eliminate, or mitigate them. Um, our Primary funding sources are listed at the bottom of the slide, some examples. Uh, we do work with, uh, with car companies, uh, with companies that provide uh, services to um, OEMs. Um, and we also have funding from the, um, from the government, uh, federal agencies, as well as provincial agencies. Uh, given that the majority of the audience here today uh, consists of our alumni. I figured um, I should give kind of an overview of where my graduate students go to once they graduate. Um, of course, there is the academic um, route that they take. So I do have uh, students who are professors, uh, mainly in the, in the States. Um, I also have students go to the industry and uh, I have at least one person here, Pamela, who is at MEA Forensic Engineers listed here. Um, in the audience. So I have students who do driving uh, behavior research, but who also do research in the healthcare domain. And they also do get hired for um, positions that require data science skills. Um, so the applied statistics part um, in the title of my lab is actually uh, quite, quite real. Um, and the, the reason why statistics takes on such a central role um, in our research is because of the variability uh, in human operators. So it's hard to write a, uh, an equation that's deterministic to um, describe what a human uh, would be doing in a given situation. So there is variability around that. So statistics is, is quite essential. Um, the type of methods that we use in the driving domain is varied. Uh, we do crash data analysis. So these would be analysis of data collected by, um, by government agencies, municipalities, police reported uh, data. Uh, we conduct surveys to understand why people behave in certain ways. And we also um, create conditions and scenarios in our driving simulator. Um, to, um, to test 
uh, different technologies or different interfaces and see how drivers react to those. Um, the driving simulator that we have gives us the ability to put people in situations that we normally wouldn't put them on the road. For example, it would be unethical to ask someone to test, text and drive, but we know that people are doing that and we can ask them to do it in the simulator and we can create um, repeatable controlled conditions uh, where we can get as close as possible to cause and effect relations. Um, so the images that you see um, at the bottom here is uh, from our driving simulator. Um, and the, the person here sitting in the driver's seat is wearing an eye tracking equipment. So we do collect um, in addition to driving performance data, um, eye tracking data as well as physiological measures. Um, on the right, you do see a video um, currently playing hopefully on your screens of um, the eye tracking and uh, the red crosshair basically shows where the person is looking at. So this enables us to assess where the driver is um, kind of focusing their attention on, um, how distracting, let's say, a technology might be. Um, simulators are, are good for certain things, but they also like realism. Um, so for certain questions, let's say, um, for example, for studying how people pay attention to vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians or cyclists, simulators are not the best venue. And uh, for uh, questions like that, we use our instrumented vehicle. Um, the images that you see here are from a, an actual car that we have, uh, which has instrumentation that enables us to, to pull data from the vehicle canvas, um, several video images all synchronized as well as eye tracking and physiological data so that we can um, observe behavior as it more naturally occurs um, in the real world. Uh, but we also go one step further at times. So uh, for our instrumented vehicle, it's still um, a not so familiar environment for our participants. So the, the real naturalistic studies are when we actually instrument people's own vehicles and we observe them for extended periods of time. Of course, as you go from simulator to instrumented vehicle to instrumenting people's own vehicles, you actually lose control, but then you gain realism. Um, so we do use a wide range of methods to really understand um, driver behavior and how we can enhance um, safety. So this is actually um, a research study that gained quite a bit of media attention. So um, the, the results are going to be published hopefully soon. Um, we have actually had people navigate through intersections in downtown Toronto and uh, investigated where they were looking at or where they were failing to look at. Uh, so this was a no failure case. We would actually go through these images and, and rate uh, whether the, the person is paying attention to areas of importance. Um, so this one, for example, was a failure um, because the person did not check right um, as they were making that right turn. Actually, when, if you look at the image um, on the screen at the bottom right, it's this intersection that the person was making a right turn and um, approaching that intersection, intersection because of the, the parked cars, um, the view of the bicycle lane was actually blocked, which necessitated uh, people to make an over the shoulder check. And if the participant didn't make it, then that was a failure. Um, so we observed um, about 26% of, uh, of the turns to have a failure such as this one, which is actually alarming, but at the same time, maybe not so uh, surprising for downtown Toronto. We do know that there are issues um, for pedestrian and cyclist safety in our city. Um, our participants were 35 to 55 years old, um, lowest crash risk group actually. And we had half of our drivers who um, recruited from people who cycle and half of them who did not cycle regularly. And we did see a big difference between their um, 
uh, how they were paying attention to um, at these different intersections uh, between cyclists and non-cyclist drivers. Um, so there are some infrastructure issues, right? So this, uh, this uh, parking lane separating the cycle lane from the vehicle traffic, although it does um, reduce conflicts, right? There's separation. It can actually create issues when the, the two streams of traffic merge again at the intersection. And uh, there are also potential for connected vehicle technologies such as uh, blind spot warnings to, to help drivers. Uh, pay attention to, um, to these areas of importance. So uh, I started with, uh, with videos of uh, drivers failing in downtown Toronto to pay attention. Um, and this is not to blame the, the driver or the vulnerable road users. There are certain limits of, um, of humans. If you have taken a human factors course from me or someone else, you, you would know that, right? Um, and when you look at the crash statistics, actually 95% of crashes are attributed to driver factors one way or another. And the, the reasons um, for um, this is, is varied. Uh, first off, that we have general limitations in our human information processing abilities. Right? Attention is a limited resource if we are not looking, I mean, we can, um, get some peripheral information, but if there's something happening behind me, I'm not going to be able to see that. Um, and uh, I might be cognitively overloaded. So if let's say someone is talking to me, then um, it has been shown that I would actually uh, start kind of focusing my visual attention on a certain area and not really scan the periphery as much. Um, so there are some known um, general limitations in our um, information processing abilities that lead to these crashes. Uh, but there can also be degradation in these uh, information processing abilities. Uh, these can be transient, alcohol, drugs, fatigue, or potentially permanent. Um, as we age, for example, uh, we have a harder time um, to let's say disengage from something that captures our attention. Let's say our phone starts ringing and then it attracts our attention and we would have a harder time to actually um, get our attention back on the road. Uh, there might be medical conditions. So these type of um, questions have been a focus of research for, for several and several decades. And uh, I don't think some have been resolved at all, such as uh, drowsiness or fatigue, still uh, major issues as well as distraction. Um, there might be intentional engagement in risk behaviors. Um, you might hear of people speeding, um, and these might be due to personality, attitudes, kind of perceived social norms. Uh, and there might be a lack of skill issues, uh, in particular with novice drivers. In terms of distraction, so I wanted to share this. This is uh, kind of interesting. There was this um, large naturalistic study. So as I mentioned, there are studies where um, researchers instrument people's own vehicles. So this study called the Sharp 2 um, Naturalistic Driving Study um, instrumented uh, the vehicles of uh, over 3,000 drivers and collected data from them over, uh, over a year or so. And uh, there was a lot of video recording and there was coding done afterwards. Um, and what they found was uh, about 50% of the time when people are driving, they're observably distracted. Um, so it is kind of our normal state in driving. And this is because driving is, unless you are just starting to drive, it's a fairly skill-based activity that you don't really have to pay too much conscious attention towards. Um, it's fairly automatic and it does give us the ability to do other things at the same time. However, um, it really depends on what that other thing is uh, when it comes to safety. So anything that takes our eyes off the road is, um, can be extremely dangerous. So what you're seeing here is um, basically results from that study um, for, I, I picked the ones that are related to technology. Um, so the the left column is the type of the the distracting activity odds ratio in this case it's also relative risk um is um 
how much more likely you are um, to be involved in a crash given this activity versus if you were attentive. So for example, cell phone total. So if you're using a handheld cell phone, uh, you are 3.6 times more likely to be in a crash compared to if you were actually looking ahead on the road. Um, and then the, the last column is the baseline prevalence, kind of what percentage of the time people have been observed to engage in these activities. So quite, uh, quite common. And distraction is really, although we may think that these are all conscious decisions that people make um, to engage in these type of distractions, it may not be. Um, it really is a continuum. It can go from involuntary, habitual to voluntary. Uh, voluntary engagement in distraction um, is driven by social psychological factors such as attitudes toward that um, perceived social norms um, or perceived behavioral control. Um, involuntary distraction relates to ability to suppress and able to disengage from an attention capture. So this is, let's say your phone is ringing and then it attracts your attention or unintentionally and it can actually cause uh, safety issues. And there's also this habit component to distraction as well. This is because we use our, our um, carry in devices uh, outside of the vehicle all the time too, that habits form and we may um, engage in a distracting activity without really consciously thinking about it. And understanding why a behavior happens um, can um, let us deal with that or come up with countermeasures that are appropriate um, to deal with that behavior. Um, so you might have seen, let's say, I think Apple has it now. Um, there's the ability of uh, putting your phone in driving mode. Uh, we call these function lockouts. Um, and these may be effective for involuntary habitual distraction. There was this study back in 2013 with Michigan DOT volunteers. Um, and there was a cell phone blocker technology above certain speed. And, um, and these are Department of Transportation volunteers, right? So you, you would assume that these would be the type of people who would adopt uh, for safety reasons. Um, but people actually frequently bypassed it. And there was, a, there was an attempt to study this technology with teen drivers. And because of the dramatic dropout, they actually ended up with not enough participants that the teens wanted to be connected. Um, so this type of technology can work, but it may not work for everyone. So for voluntary distraction, let's say for our teen drivers, they may actually have to target behavioral modification. Um, in our lab, we have actually done a series of studies looking at teenage driver distractions. And we found, um, we have tested real-time feedback. This would be um, capturing how long you take your eyes away from the road and then giving you an alert um, as you're looking away to get your eyes back on the road. We have compared this to um, kind of giving a report card to the teens at the end of a drive, showing what their parents were doing in relation to them. And that parental report card was actually way more effective than just real-time. Um, real-time eyes of fraud feedback. Yeah. So up until this point, I kind of talked about driver distraction and wanted to give you kind of an idea of um, what the approach is in human factors research that we do want to understand um, the underlying causes um, so that we can come up with strategies um, that, would, um, that would be informed um, to deal with um, with the issues that we're studying. Um, in general, though, driving has been changing. Um, so we talked about driver distraction being an issue. Um, and the, the past 20 years or so, this has been a hot topic in, um, in driving domain, um, in driving research, uh, in particular because of the rise and the prevalence of infotainment and carried in technologies. Um, However, we now are seeing also smarter vehicles and traffic technologies. Um, there's quite a bit of activity in the research domain uh, for being able to um, detect driver state. So I told you about this eyes off the road 
feedback, right? That actually needs to um, have a driver state detection technology to, to work. Um, so in the lab, we were assuming that we could get that, but now uh, these are becoming more of a reality and there's a push for that. Um, there's traffic information, collision avoidance systems, um, and the driving task is becoming highly automated as well. However, there are some issues here that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so the, these are the type of smart vehicle technologies that actually work very well because the technology is developed to support the, the limitations of the human driver. Um, so the, at the top we see from 2020, that's a study from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, an independent organization uh, that found trucks equipped with forward collision warning and advanced emergency braking to decrease crashes significantly. Um, and at the bottom, we have again a report from the same uh, organization for Volvo City Safety uh, System, which is again uh, similar for with collision warning as well as um, emergency braking. And rear end crashes were, were found to go down by about 40% uh, with that technology. And the reason here is that, um, as I said, if I'm not looking at on the road, if I'm looking at something else, right, I might miss important information. And these systems actually um, help the driver to, to respond or respond for the driver when the driver fails to do so. And we do know that drivers may, like 50% of the time, you're engaged in an observable distraction. And right, if you're doing that in a very inopportune time, then you might be in a crash situation. So this is, uh, these type of technologies fall on SAE level zero, for those of you who have heard about this levels of driving automation taxonomy. Um, these are driver support features. They are basically limited to providing warnings and momentary assistance. Although they, it may seem like because they are level zero that they shouldn't be as good as the other levels, that is not the case. These are actually, uh, well working systems, although they might have some over reliance issues, et cetera, uh, compared to really anything else um, on, this, on this level from a safety perspective. And you might have heard of people will say, well, 95% of the crashes are due to driver factors, so we're going to completely eliminate the driver and we're going to solve all these issues. So they are talking about this SAE level five. Um, automated driving features. These automated driving features will not require you to take over driving, so the car does it for you. And this feature can drive the vehicle under all conditions. This is the pipe dream. That is, I, I don't know if it's gonna happen in my lifetime. Um, Cause they're talking about all conditions. And as engineers, we know that, uh, that this would be a very challenging thing to do. Um, in terms of where we are for automated vehicle technologies, the technology is actually also far from perfect, although drivers are far from perfect too. We are better than the current technology um, uh, in many aspects uh, because perception, which is, uh, which is a very is an easy task for us most of the time, right? Um, unless the lighting conditions are problematic, is a very hard problem for, um, for teaching machines to do. Um, so that was a uh, Tesla vehicle, uh, which would fall on SAE level two. Again, a driver support feature, although it may be called autopilot. Uh, it is not really an automated driving feature in the sense that you cannot entirely leave the driving task um, to, the, to the vehicle. And these technologies basically require your um, eyes to be on the road at all times, as well as your hands uh, to be on the steering wheel so that um, when the vehicle fails and it would fail, uh, definitely, um, that you take over. Um, however, there are uh, over-reliance issues. Uh, misuse is um, actually not uncommon with these vehicles. So here you can see um, the driver sticking a, uh, an orange to fool the sensor on the steering wheel, 
um, to think that the driver's hands are on the wheel and then the driver can do other things, although they're not supposed to. <clears throat> and when we, this is research that is done, that was done in our laboratory. So what happens is when you give the um, lateral and longitudinal control together um, to, the, to the car and ask the driver to monitor, it actually becomes a hard task for the human to do. It's easier to drive yourself. And uh, so this is a vigilance uh, task. And what people do is they actually start doing other things, right? Because they're just sitting there and watching the road is not what uh, people want to do. Um, so we found that, um, and others have found that, people do take their eyes off the road for longer periods of time in, in a single level two vehicle, the automated vehicle here on the right, compared to non-automated vehicles. And if they're not actually engaged in a distraction, if they're not looking away, then with the vigilance task, um, it will turn into um, boredom, drowsiness, and fatigue. So when not engaged in distraction, fatigue would actually be more likely to set in. And uh, this, uh, this kind of explains uh, that, like, you either need to engage in a, uh, in a secondary task or you, you do fall asleep. Um, so basically this is the yorkeys dodson law, um, which does show the relation between performance, human performance and physical arousal. Uh, physical arousal can also be replaced with let's say workload or how hard you are working. So when we are not doing much, that's our underload region. Uh, we actually, our performance tends to decline um, because uh, we do get drowsy and, and fatigued. Or if we are asked to do too much, then our performance also drops because we might be overstimulated or stressed. So in a level two vehicle, when you do take away the longitudinal and lateral control, you're kind of putting the driver in the underload region unless they engaged in a different activity, a secondary activity to get their arousal back up, they're going to actually um, see a decline in their performance. Um, there can also be issues when technology is actually near perfect. Um, so I will not do point that out. So this is uh, another point for research. So here a German couple out for a Christmas drive ended up in a river, apparently because their luxury car's navigation system forgot to mention that they had to wait for a ferry. Um, the couple were out driving, came to a ferry crossing, um, but that information was never stored in their car's navigation system. Um, so the, the current level two systems problems are different than this, but I think we also need to, to understand that um, even if we get very reliable technology, we still may have, uh, we still have problems and we still need to, to understand how humans actually interact with such technologies to, um, to avoid accidents or catastrophes. Um, so, so far I, I liked level zero. I thought level five isn't gonna happen. Level two, we have it, it's not very safe. Um, what's more, more probably realistic to happen in the near future is SAU level four. Um, so these are again like SAU level five, um, you don't need to drive at all, um, but the vehicle drives under limited conditions and it will not operate unless all required conditions are met. So before we do see like our personal vehicle capable of driving itself under all conditions, we're actually going to see these uh, probably public transport vehicles um, being able to drive themselves in controlled environments. Um, for level four, for our personal vehicles, an example can be highway driving where the um, environment is more structured or no pedestrians uh, most of the time. Um, that uh, we can actually design the vehicle to be more reliable um, in automatic driving mode. Um, so what you see at the bottom picture is eyes. That's from Jaguar Land Rover. Um, so with these type of technologies, 
the human factors lies um, not just within the vehicle in the sense that the, the occupants have to trust, right? And the vehicle, but also um, with interactions um, in terms of outside of the vehicle and what kind of a human machine interface you need to create for pedestrians or cyclists to, to understand what these, uh, what these vehicles are up to. Um, and then there's this SAE level three, which is a, kind of a dangerous, dangerous system. Um, so you can kind of see this taxonomy is not, is not linear in any sense or doesn't really have, uh, have much sense in terms of, of the levels. Um, so for level three, when the future requests, you must drive. Um, basically, imagine yourself um, for, with your Tesla car, um, there might be a request to put your hands back on the wheel. Uh, but uh, they imagine that with these level three vehicles, you don't even watch the road at all. And then the vehicle knows at some point that it's unable to handle the driving situation and it gives you a warning or a takeover request uh, for you to, to step in. Um, so these are called takeover requests. Um, I mean, you, I, I assume that uh, most of you can see what kind of problems can happen with this, especially at high speeds. Uh, first of all, um, how does the vehicle know? How well does the vehicle know um, that, there, that it won't be able to handle the situation? And then how much emergency is there, right? Um, can you actually be talking to someone, be in a heated discussion, and then have three seconds to take back the, the controls? Um, what people have been, have been seeing in driving simulator studies is uh, when you tell people why well, you don't need to watch the road, right, they actually move their, their seat behind. And then when there's an emergency request, the first thing that they do is trying to figure out where the, the vehicle controls are, right? So that's uh, like thinking that humans will be able to take over in a couple of seconds. There's a seven second uh, rule of thumb uh, number that's going around nowadays. It's, it's just uh, uh, unreasonable. And there might also be silent failure. So these, these type of vehicles um, are problematic if they do, if they do get put um, out on the road. Um, and you can kind of see when a takeover request happens, you're gonna take the person from potentially boredom um, to, um, to sheer terror, right? Um, and they have to react uh, within a few seconds. Um, but this idea of, um, of arousal and what the driver is doing is, um, is important in terms of how the vehicle or automated vehicle functions can communicate with the driver. So driver state monitoring is actually now getting a lot of attention uh, within both the research uh, community as well as from a regulation perspective. Um, okay, I wanna leave some time for, for questions. So I'm gonna go through these fast. I think I have four or five more slides. So this is um, research done in my lab uh, by one of my PhD students. He's looking at ways uh, for automation to communicate. Um, information to the human driver so that the, the takeover or just monitoring of the automation by the human is, um, is done well. Um, so here you're, you're seeing a takeover request. It can be with an auditory sound as well as a head up display in this case where the, the vehicle is telling you to break, uh, but it can also be so rather than just not giving any information to the driver throughout the drive, but just giving a warning when there's a takeover needed, um, we do explore showing more reliability information or the automation capability information throughout the drive so that you do not put the driver in boredom at most times and then into sheer terror, terror uh, when the takeover happens. Um, and we, however, when we actually provided information like this, we found drivers to really over rely and not monitor um, the automation as much. Uh, when we did include another display highlighting surrounding traffic information, 
um, in particular um, kind of things that are happening on the road that the driver may have to pay attention to that's actually results in more uh, proper reliance. NTSB, which is a national um, tr transportation safety board in the US, uh, TSB in Canada, um, was actually pulled into investigating both the Uber, um, Uber automated vehicle crash as well as the Tesla crash and the investigation took about two years. NTSB is the body that mainly does investigations for aviation accidents where there is complex fees. And, um, and one of the, they have provided nine recommendations and one of the recommendations was collaborative development of standards for driver monitoring systems to minimize driver disengagement prevent automation complacency and account for foreseeable misuse of the automation. And uh, European Union now is, in addition to making speed limiters in vehicles uh, mandatory by 2022, they also um, are making driver monitors mandatory. So hopefully we're going to be seeing more regulation to um, get the vehicle manufacturers um, implement these automated vehicles technologies, not just for the sake of technology or creating media hype, uh, but also ensuring that that safety happens. This is not to say that all vehicle manufacturers are the same, but some are, uh, some take a safer approach than the others. Um, and in terms of uh, driver monitoring, um, again, as I said, there's quite a bit of research in this field. Um, one can use vehicle-based measures um, there is uh, computer vision based uh, measures uh, looking at facial and body expression, uh, physiological measures. Um, so the, it is still a challenge to identify driver state, especially um, things that are not as overt as let's say, you know, turning entirely uh, to your right, but being lost in thought. Uh, but uh, there, there is definitely uh, quite a bit of value to um, to create these systems to go in our vehicles, not just for automated vehicle technologies, but also for manual driving. I will skip this part. Okay. Um, so some takeaway and future outlook. Um, there is significant advances in, in vehicle technologies, but also much hype. Um, and the capabilities of vehicle automation um, that are being put in the market are commonly inflated. Um, you know, there's a labeling issue. Uh, some, some countries are actually um, banned uh, Tesla to call its, uh, its system an autopilot because it does create um, incorrect expectations from the, from the users. Um, and systems that consider human factors are safer. Uh, an advanced emergency braking system is also an automated system. That is, it takes a task that the human does and, um, and does the task for the human. Um, it may not sound as cool as a self-driving car, however, uh, quite effective. Um, and there's a wide range of human factors to consider. So it's not just our attention abilities, but it's also um, our attitudes, um, what we think is acceptable to do on the road, um, so on and so forth. Um, road to full automation, which is level five, um, that is uh, cars that can drive under all uh, circumstances is long. I, I don't know when that would be. It's not next year or the following year as uh, some people claim in the media. Um, but something like level four, uh, that is, um, uh, vehicles that are automated, fully automated, but under only certain conditions are much closer and can actually help solve um, quite a bit of issues um, about mobility. I can help with um, enhancing public transport, um, such as solving the last mile problem, uh, as some of you might have, might have heard. And expect, and I do hope for, a more regulation for automated vehicle functions and safety systems, in particular driver monitoring systems. So thank you very much. I have 10 minutes. Hopefully this was uh, 
this was a, a helpful overview of, of, uh, of state of the art, as much as I know, as well as my opinions, I guess, about different vehicle technologies and where they're going. I am happy to answer your questions. Well, that was, uh, that was marvelous, Pearson. So uh, on behalf of all the participants, thank you. That was a really uh, engaging presentation and I think left us with um, lots to think about. So we did get a few, uh, a few questions in the Q&A from um, a couple of our, uh, of our audience in particular. So I'm gonna, I'll just ask you some of these and uh, some of them are more comments than questions. But early on, you showed a, a picture from the, the car that you have instrumented that was driving around corners and um, uh, Rick Ross, who, uh, welcome, Rick, uh, who I know, um, asked the question just broadly, to what extent have zebra crosswalks actually improved safety? And I guess we could more broadly ask, to what extent does, you know, how a city kind of uh, paints the road, for example, to what extent does that uh, influence the, the safety of uh, drivers and pedestrians? Mm -hmm. um, so infrastructure definitely has a big role in terms of the safety of, uh, of vulnerable road users. Um, the best thing to do is physically separating, obviously, uh, vulnerable road users from the drivers. That is not to say that drivers are dangerous, it's just um, in a place like downtown Toronto, where there's a lot of attentional demands on the drivers, right? Drivers just may not be able to pay attention to why they have to pay attention at all times. Um, and, in, and especially when they're under pressure with uh, having to make a turn on right, uh, on, uh, on red light, um, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of how much it actually has improved, um, it is hard to, to assess the efficacy of one particular um, infrastructure change. Because in general, what we see is um, the cities would actually change multiple things at once. Um, so to pinpoint if something has improved safety or not um, is, is hard to quantify. Um, but I think there is um, there's some common sounds involved basically in terms of uh, what works and what doesn't. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, so we have someone, uh, Will Litwin, who asked a few questions, but um, he, uh, he points out that he really liked the, the breakdown at some point that you had that pointed out that, that drivers who are also cyclists kind of pay more attention to certain things than mm -hmm. drivers who aren't. Um, but he then goes on to point out that cyclists are often terrible uh, or are often terrible at, um, at respecting the rules of the road, right? And, and, and so uh, the question, I suppose, is uh, do we have any sense of whether um, people who cycle are also better or worse drivers? In general, we, I don't think we know. It's just in this case for the particular group that we observed, um, who would you would expect to be better drivers just based on their, their age um, and driving experience. Um, that they were, cyclists were more attentive to vulnerable road users, likely because they um, right? They fill the other shoes as well, so they can kind of expect how cyclists may behave. Um, in terms of cyclists uh, being, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it goes to maybe how the infrastructure is set that people aren't, uh, aren't following rules and the rules may not be clear because of uh, the infrastructure too. So there's some training. Um, there's some role of training or lack of training maybe in terms of how cyclists behave, but also the cyclist facilities uh, in certain cities such as Toronto may not be uh, well designed, right? leading to inappropriate behavior as well. Let me, I just, uh, it's actually great. I think we have a, a few other people who are putting up questions now. So let me, I'm gonna turn to a couple of others acknowledging that we can't get to all of them today. So I. I actually, um, I don't know who this is. This is someone who identifies as a 4JST capital D7, but, um, but a, a PhD grad out of MIE from uh, about 20 years ago who asked um, what types of vehicle sensors are usually used to monitor human factors. I don't know if you can provide a, mm -hmm. quick, a quick overview of what you're putting into the cars. <clears throat> um, well, so there is the, what we put in our research vehicle. Uh, which is very expensive, right? That eye tracking equipment is about $20,000. 
Um, so that type of vehicle, that type of equipment won't be getting into our production vehicles anytime mm -hmm. soon, right? Um, however, for monitoring, um, there are cheap ways of pulling data. So it's um, like your vehicle actually is recording a lot of um, vehicle kinematic data. Mm -hmm. um, there can be, uh, now cameras are cheap. So camera-based vision systems can be used, although there are limitations. Um, or like the, the sensor on the Tesla steering wheel to capture whether your hands are on the wheel or not. Right? Um, so this is kind of the state of the art uh, currently, but technologies do advance rapidly, uh, especially hardware and computing. And uh, you know, what, what is very expensive today may not be uh, in five years, so. Yeah, by the way, I, I uh, uh, that that uh, participant identified himself. It's Navid Nemed Gizadeh, who I uh, who I knew as a PhD student when I was doing my PhD around 20 <laughs> years ago. So hello, Navid. Um, so maybe another question just in the last couple of minutes. Um, somebody has just asked, um, in your studies, do you factor in the skill level of the drivers, kind of um, people who are professional drivers versus uh, amateurs? Um, well, not, not professional, but we have done quite a bit of research on driving experience and how that um, relates to uh, where people look at on the road and whether uh, we can use technologies to actually uh, maybe direct the gaze or um, like glance location of novice drivers in similar ways um, on the road. So yes, yes, we do look at skill level. And we do get sometimes uh, to get really experienced drivers, we have actually worked with professional drivers as well. And maybe I'm gonna combine, ask you one last question and then we'll wrap up, um, kind of combine a, a couple of questions that have appeared. So, so, so to what extent, um, A, does the, um, do the rules of the road, so to speak, or the laws on the road kind of allow for the incorporation or the adoption of this automated technology and, and to what extent are those rules kind of getting in the way of that i suppose um and then and then tied to that uh, your thoughts on the public's um, willingness to accept some of this um, technology um and allow it kind of mm -hmm. as as the technology kind of gets uh, more and more sophisticated mm -hmm. yeah um so the, I did say that perception is hard, right? Perception is, uh, is an easier problem when the environment is, um, has less uncertainty. Um, so if you could actually control the infrastructure, have very well um, right, painted lanes, uh, not really have pedestrians stepping in front, um, and you could even have like um, connected vehicle techno infrastructure and vehicle where the you know information is sent from the infrastructure to the vehicle directly right those would really make automated vehicles uh, much easier to implement uh, but uh, I mean currently right so the I think the average age of a vehicle fleet at least in the US is seven or eight years old right so we are not gonna see these like all of a sudden not all vehicles will become automated so uh, researchers have to consider that like sharing the road with manually controlled vehicles and, and really infrastructure is very expensive to overhaul um, completely uh, in a new manner. Sorry, the second question was? Well, uh, it was just around your thoughts on the public, the, the, the public willingness to accept some of this uh, technology. Yeah, so public's willing, will, it is, it is hard uh, to say, right? It's, um, I guess we are kind of, you know, we've been given no option, but these Tesla vehicles are out there, right? And we kind of accept it um, in terms of whether I would get in one when the driver is engaging the autopilot and going in the back seat, right? That I wouldn't accept. So, um, it goes to, again, public education. I think people, there was a rosier picture before and people thought that, oh, you know, I'm gonna have a soft driving car within a few years. And now people are realizing, there was just too much over promise that people sure. are seeing that's not gonna happen. And probably the acceptance is now going down. Well, I'll finish just with this, I, or, or with this question. I, I, when you talked about getting in the back seat of a Tesla, I, I thought to ask, so what kind of car do you drive, Pearson? <clears throat> <laughs> I, do not, I do not drive. 
anymore. Well, so I, I drank from my parents' vehicle, which is a Volkswagen, an old one, and then my lab has a Toyota. Um, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, so it's, uh, sure. I think, 2016 model. Right. Well, listen, I, um, on behalf of all of the, the people who have joined us, I think uh, this was a, a marvelous presentation and uh, some wonderful answers to questions as well. So I, uh, I thank you for doing this for us. And, uh, and to all who have joined us, to alumni, um, thank you very much. I think uh, there'll be another one of these uh, research spotlights, I think, uh, in, a, in a couple of months. I don't have the date in front of me, but, um, but I hope you will join us again and, uh, and find other ways as well to, uh, to kind of connect with uh, our Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering and more broadly with the U of T. So 